All right, in this unit, we're going to be taking a look at how to format worksheets using Excel. And so I'm going to pause my recording and how to format Excel spreadsheets this time. So I'm going to start Excel. I'm going to kind of do it the way I should have had you do it last week because you're used to this. Remember, you can copy like I did to the desktop right here. I don't have access to the iDrive on my laptop. So I have to get it from my desktop, but you start Excel and then go looking for the workbook. Right, so I'm going to open another workbook, and this is what you learned in Microsoft Word. You can do the same thing. And then you go find the iDrive. In my case, it's on my desktop, so I've got to find it from there. And the file we're looking for is in the tutorial folder for Unit 2. The tutorial folder, there should be a sales XLS file. And it should look something like this. And we do want to put our name and date in there. Normally it doesn't really matter because you're not turning it into me. This is the way I know you did it. But you're not turning this into me. But put your name in there anyways. And for the date, let's put in today's date. But remember there's a shortcut. If you don't want the year, or if you, if you want the current year, excuse me, if you want the current year, just type the date. So today is the 6th, and I'm going to stop right there and just press enter. Now you get a funky date format, but we're going to fix that in this unit anyways. That's part of what the formatting unit is all about. Okay, I'm in the book on page 70, and it talks about formatting cells. I've got it open on a couple of screens here, so I'm going to be bouncing back and forth. Worksheets will work without formatting. What we have up here is fine, but it's kind of gross looking, and as Bob said in your word class, not something you'd want to show off to an employer or all the students here at MidState. So to make your spreadsheets a little more presentable, you're going to learn how to format them. But it has no effect on the calculations. It occasionally can have a little bit of an effect on what we see and how we analyze the data. But this is not about, this is probably an easier chapter because it's not about calculations and entering those formulas and dragging and clicking and doing those things. It's just about printing things up. We opened the workbook, did that already, and now we want to format some cell contents. Over here in A1, we want to change the font. Well, you're all word experts, so you probably have a pretty good idea of how to change the font. Just go up to the ribbon and change the font. The book suggests that you pick Algerian just to see that the live preview works so you can see what it's going to look like. We don't want necessarily an Algerian font here. And so they say when you're done, click on Calibri Light. Just like in Microsoft Word, we're using a theme. Remember, themes are predefined colors and fonts and things that Microsoft has decreed work well together. If they work so well together, I don't know why they keep changing them. Every edition of Microsoft Office has a different set of themes. Probably so you can earn our money. But each theme has a heading font, and it has a body font. And since this is a heading, we're going to use the heading font. So I chose Calibri Light. And then the book says change the font size to 26. So we drop that down, and again, Live Preview shows us the size 26. I'm going too fast. Ask me to hang on a second. Book says make it bold. You can do it either way by clicking the big B on the ribbon, or as the ribbon says, Control B works just as well, makes the current cell bold. Remember in the last unit, we learned that if there's room, if there's nothing in B1, the text data will spill over automatically. As long as you don't put anything in there, it'll spill over. So we're in good shape there. Uh, for A2, we're supposed to shrink it down a little bit, make it size 10. They want it italicized. Since my hand's already on the mouse and I was just over here, I'm not going to use the keyboard. I just try to be as efficient as possible. If I'm typing, 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 and I need something italics, I'll do Control-I. My hand's already on the mouse. I'll click on the button. It's easier. Then we're supposed to select A4 to A6, 
that's these guys, oops, these guys, and bold face those. Again, my hand's on the mouse from the selection, so I'm not going to do the control B. When you take those tests, do they make you do control B, or can you bold it however the heck you want? They'll, they'll ask you to do it another way, but they want it the other way. That's annoying. I suppose you'll learn something by doing it, by learning all four different ways of doing control B, but I would find that annoying. Because remember, I can right click here too, right? And say, give me bold or font or something. For, there's no bold here, but I can do format and bold. There's so many different ways. But it's a program. It's probably, it has limits to how smart it can be. Okay, then they want us to click someplace else to deselect the range. Moving on to page, I'm on 73 already if you're trying to follow along. And now ours looks just like theirs. In Microsoft Word, you learned how to change colors, 74. Pick the first two cells here, A1 and A2. Remember, you don't have to highlight B1 and C1 and D1 to get this red reps. All of the text is in A1 and A2, so any changes we make to these two automatically apply to that text that spills over. They want the text to be red, so I'm going to pull this down, though you don't have to. And let's talk just briefly about all these different colors. I'm sure in Microsoft Word you talked about the theme colors. If you pick one of these theme colors, if you change themes, the color changes with it. If you choose a standard color, like red, and you change themes, they don't change. They stay red. You can create more colors. According to the book, if we do the custom, these are nice to choose from, but according to the book, if we choose custom, there are 16 billion, million, billion? I forget. Go look. Maybe that was in the notes. Hang on just a second. I've got to make sure I'm not lying to you. Font colors, standard ones, 16 million. That makes more sense. 16.7 million colors in this box here for you to choose from. And according to the text, more colors than your eye can even tell the difference of. But you should be able to find a halfway decent color in there. What I often do will be click somewhere and then bring this guy up until I see a color that I like. Just play around with it. These numbers over here, there's a handful of programmers in the room, so I want to mention it to them. These and web programmers and web developers, if you turn into one of those, these are the colors that designate for this shade of red, there's 242 parts red, 68 parts green, and 85 parts blue. It doesn't look like it, but if you were to do that with your primary colors, you'd get the same shade of salmon or whatever that might be. So if there's a specific color in your company logo, they might be able to tell you that it's 200 parts red and 100 parts green and 50 parts blue. You can just type those in here and you'll get it. So I could do a 200 in there and 100 in here, and as soon, and notice the color's changing as I go, and 50 for the blue, and that's a kind of a brownish color. But we don't need that. We just need the standard color, so I'm going to cancel that. And remember, if this little letter, just like in Microsoft Word, if it already has the right color underneath, you don't even have to drop it down. Just click it. And now i got red text. There's a lot of talk for red text. Now, we formatted entire cells. What if I want to format just part of the cell? And then, just like in Microsoft Word, we have to highlight the part of the text that we want first, and then format it. And in Excel, there's a diff two different ways to do that. You can point to the cell and double-click it, and that allows you to edit it in place. Notice my blinking ver cursor there. I'm editing in place, and we want to change big flavor and make it bigger. Some people, like me, find that annoying to have to double-click and then highlight. I'm going to click out and then back in again. Another way to do it is just to go up here to the formula bar and highlight what you want. No double-clicking required. Highlight what you want. And the book says change the size of that to 14. Whoa. Oh, press Enter in my case because I put it up there. So now I have big flavor, small price. One other shortcut key the book shows you that I find very, very useful is the F2 key. The F2 key on your keyboard is the edit key. Notice my cursor is on A2. If I press the F2 key on my keyboard, it puts me into edit mode so I don't have to double click. 
that's going to come in handy when we're Excel. That might have been there in Microsoft Word. I find myself using that F2 key quite a bit to quickly change something. That works in Windows. Oh, I just remembered where I use it all the time. In Windows, you want to rename a file, F2. Select it, press F2. Instead of double-clicking it and that launches it, darn, that's not what I wanted. I want to change the name. Instead of right-clicking rename, click the file, F2, and then you can type. So, a little power tip of the day. Okay, we got the big flavor, we got the font size, now what? Background colors. Every cell has a background color. Let me catch up here, show you where I am for those of you trying to keep up. I'm on page 76. I keep using the wrong keyboard. Page se oh, I love this about the Excel book. Online, I have to type the EX. And I have to have the cursor in the right spot. EX underscore 76. There we go. This is where I am. We can fill the background color. To change the fill, we use the fill button, which is right next to the font color button, or very near it. So I'm going back to Excel now. And here's the fill button. Notice the fill button does not work when you're editing text. Right now, I'm in the process still, as I pressed F2, of editing that cell. What if you change your mind? Make some big changes, and then go, oh, I didn't want to change that. It's the wrong cell. You press Escape, and it cancels edit mode, and it cancels any changes to that cell. So if I type Volker and I go, oh, man, that's a wrong cell, escape before you press Enter, and it's just like an undo, just even quicker. Okay, we want to fill some stuff here. It says select A4 to A6. So these guys again. And we want to change the background color of that to yellow, and here my little paint can already has yellow. I could just click on it, or I can drop down the list, and there's the same color selector stuff we just saw for fonts. I want to use the standard color, yellow. Then they want us to change the font color to red. I already have red. Oh, wait a minute. No, they don't. Really? Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> they show the button in the book as yellow, but then they tell me to change it to red. So the background color. The background color needs to be changed to red. And now that's getting kind of hard to read. So let's change the font color to white. And they want this version of white. You all know that when the book says change it to white background one, you just keep flying around these things until you hover on the one that says what they tell you to. It'll tell you. They often tell you it's in row seven, column three, or something ridiculous like that. Real world, you pick what looks good. There, I got white on red. Select B4 to B6. Okay. Again, I'm not selecting all of this text that goes all the way over. I don't have to. Any change I make to B6 applies to all that other text as well. Change the column width to 30. Now we could drag it. And that's about, there's 30. You remember, we can go right click and set the column width if we want it to be exact to 30. That's easier than dragging if somebody tells you make it 30. Real world, nobody tells you that. They say stretch it till it looks good. Shrink it so it doesn't take up so much room. They don't give you exact sizes. They give you, they just, in the real world, I never look at those sizes. I have to look up how to change it to the exact width. Just like in Microsoft Word tables, we can wrap text. But before we do that, they want borders? Or did I miss something again? Hang on. Doo, 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 doo. And then wrap the text. I wish they bold faced that. Wrap the text. Here's the button for wrap text. And that says if it doesn't fit in the cell, start a new line. And there it goes. What they don't tell us to do ever, it makes me crazy, is move this purpose up. Doesn't it look a little funky with the purpose down there on the bottom? I think it does. To move it up, simply click in that cell. And then remember from last unit, these six buttons here let you adjust the top, middle, bottom, left, center, right. I want it at the top. And there, that looks much better. So if text is really wide, sometimes you can make it wrap. It didn't look so bad the way it was before, but I guess this looks better to them. 
Again, select A4 to B6. And add borders. To add borders, we use the border button, just like in uh, Word tables. Here's the border button next to the bold, italics, and underline. If you drop that list down, there are a bunch of predefined border types. And a little later, we'll learn how to use more borders. And I don't think I'm going to get into these other ones. What we want right now is all borders. All borders gives you borders around the outside, in between, column borders, kind of like these gray ones you see all over Excel. And now they're black, and if we print this, those borders will actually display and print. Not hearing anybody yelling at me, so I'm guessing you're doing okay. We can also add a background image. It shouldn't be too complicated, I hope. We've got to find the image. What kind of background image? I recommend something subtle. As I told my programmers out on the web, you can do a search for background images or just background, and you'll find all kinds of stuff. In these examples and the ones you do in the book, they come with some images that we can try. So to add a background, we first have to go to Page Layout and then choose the Background button. And what this is going to do is add a picture that fills the entire background of this sheet. Not a big fan of this because guess what happens when you print? You can just hear your ink cartridge going ding, 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 sucking up gallons of ink to print the background. If you're never printing, this is great. So I'm going to change the background because it looks kind of cool. And it says, where do you want to get your background from? We could go to Microsoft Office Clip Art, just like you did in Microsoft Word. But this one's already stored in a file, so click the Browse button. And I don't know where it puts you, but the image you want is back out on the iDrive in that folder where you found the sales one. So I have to go to my desktop. And there's my tutorial folder, and there's the background image. Once you find it, power tip, just double click it. And now you can see that in here. My background, and if I go all the way to the bottom of my spreadsheet and scroll and scroll, notice that background's just everywhere. Must be a huge picture. Well, no, not really. It's a very small picture that's designed to be tiled. It's kind of like the tile on your floor, or the tile on the carpet here. It repeats itself over and over and over again to fill as much space as you need. Okay, so it looks like our documentation sheet's now beautiful, in case anybody wants to look at it. And now we're going to do a little bit more calculations. This is what you're here to learn in this class, is how to create these formulas, how to do calculations. This formatting is good stuff, relatively simple. The trick to Excel is the formula, so I'm glad they put some more in here. We want to go to the Sales Report tab down at the bottom to switch worksheets. And now we need to put in some more formulas. So this is good practice. None of these formulas are really all more complex than the ones we did in Unit 3. Or, why well, I got ahead of myself, in Unit 1. But we still want to calculate them. All right, the first formula we're supposed to put in is in cell C6 of this empty box right here. And they suggest that we type. And in this case, considering how far away the cells are, that may not be a bad idea, but let's not do that. I still prefer to point and shoot. In other words, click on the cells that I want. Let's go back to the Home tab. And I want to, I want to add up a range of cells. That's sum. So I'm going to Auto Sum, and I'm just going to click it. Excel says, how about I add this up? Though? No, that's not what I want. What we want is C27 to N46. Oh, my goodness. So I'm going to scroll. Here's C27. And now I'm going to go all the way down to the bottom of this beast to N, and i got to go over, and we probably should have zoomed out a little bit before we did this, but there is N46. You can see up on my formula bar it says C27 to N46. So just go down and find the 57,000 that's in the lower right-hand corner, let go, press Enter, and it filled it in. So maybe in that formula it might have been easier to type it especially since the book gave you what they want. It might have been easier to type it. Let's double check, get the same number I have. I got 9,514,000. Okay. 
in C9. That's uh, here. We're supposed to start with C6. I'm going to press the equal sign and point to C6. Be right with you. That's that total we just calculated. Minus parentheses C7 plus C8. And Ben, you could do these even if the other one's still messed up. I just clicked on it. C6, come on, sorry, my mouse is C6 minus parentheses. We need the parentheses because the order of precedence say subtract first and we want to add first. C7 plus C8, press enter. And then they say copy the formula in C9 to D9. Now there's a couple of ways you've been showed to copy. In unit three, they're going to show you this technique. No reason to wait except the darn computer program will probably tell you you can't do it that way. We can control C that, right? And then come over here and control V. That's the hard way, if you ask me. I'm going to undo that. You can leave it if you wish. I don't like the racing ants when I'm done with them. Press escape, they go away. This little guy down here in the lower right-hand corner, it's called the fill handle. You're going to learn about him in unit three. The fill handle allows you to copy stuff, fill in some cells with this same formula. It's exactly the same as copy. As soon as you get that, simply drag it to the right. Next, copy the formula. Once you get good at pointing at that and dragging, that's a whole lot easier than copy-paste. It's not always the most effective method, but it often is. Okay, now we have some more. If you're trying to follow in the book, I'm on 79. In C16, that would be here, they want us to say equals C6. So I'm going to click on equals and then C6 divided by C23. C23. Oh, there it is. Okay. Press enter to lock that in. And then the next one equals C7 divided by C23. In unit 3 you'll learn an easier way to do this. We can't copy that formula because it keeps changing it. In, in the next unit you'll learn a better way. C8 divided by C23. 8 divided by 23. And finally, C9. I'm glad I don't have 25 of those to do that. would make for a long night, wouldn't it? In the future, you'll learn how to copy multiples. Is that right? C9 divided by 23. No, divided by C23. That's better. And now, here's a real good trick. And they do talk about it in the book. Let me bring the book up here real quick. And I'm a couple pages down the road here. And I have no page button. There it is. 70, page 9. One more. Okay. Here's all those formulas we've been entering. And now they say, now that you got all these done, copy all of the formulas that you just created to the right. So all of these formulas that we just created, that's not, are those the formulas? Those formulas, right there. Those five or four formulas, you can copy them. You can copy to the clipboard and paste, or can I fill all four of them? You bet. Done. I like that a whole lot better. Select some cell someplace to get rid of the, to deselect everything. And looks like I got the same numbers they have in the book, so we're doing good. Now comes a little more complicated formula. Not terribly. We want to calculate a percent change. And the next column over here is the net change and the percent change. We're going to do the net change here in just a second. But then the percent change says take the new value minus the old value and divide by the old value. What you're going to have to learn to do at some point when you get to be Excel experts is take a formula that somebody gives you like that and translate it into something that Excel can understand. Sound familiar, programmers? 
Isn't that what we said today? For those of you who aren't programmers, I apologize, but I've got to take advantage of this teaching moment here. Okay. That things are the same, kind of all over the place. Okay, back to the book. What are we supposed to do here where it says net change? We're supposed to say equals C6. Six, oh, up here, I'm sorry, E6. Press escape to get rid of that other one. Equals C6 minus D6. So, over the last year, we've increased by, it looks like, a million or so. And now they suggest that you copy that down. Okay. But what we're going to do instead is do this formula, the percent change formula. And remember this percent change formula we just saw it is the old year minus the new year divided by. The divided by order of precedence is going to screw up, so we need parentheses. So I'll help you. Equals. Parentheses, C6, new year, minus the old year, D6. I'm watching Ben type. He's pretty brave. I like clicking on these things. Parentheses, divided by D6. Oops, D6. If you click the wrong one, just change your mind. If you click those, it's a whole lot easier. <coughs> percent change is some ugly number. But that's 12%, right? Or approximately 13% change. Highlight both of them. You can fill downward. Grab. Remember, you got to have the black plus sign, not the white one. Black plus sign. And drag down. Now, what about these empty rows in here? Well, there's a couple of things you could do. We could drag them down and then delete the empty rows. That wouldn't be so bad. But instead, I'm going to take two of these, copy them to the clipboard. Control-C or right-click copy or copy up here. Take your pick. I'm going to highlight these boxes. E11 to F12. Paste. Control-V. And then all of these down here, paste again. Paste. So sometimes the fill handle is really good. A lot of times the fill handle is really good. Other times, copy and paste makes things a little easier. If you learn all the tools, and that's why they make you learn them all in those, record, in those uh, tutorials, I guess. If you learn them all, you can speed up your processing and get these spreadsheets built a little bit faster and amaze all your friends with how quick you are. All right. Removing any highlighting, just clicking somewhere. And let's see if I've got about the same numbers they have. Yep, but we were supposed to copy them a little further. Where'd all those numbers come from? I must have missed something. Did they tell me to calculate those and I skipped it? Must have. All right, here we're supposed to have total number of customers. Or the total sales. Oh boy, I gotta find that. I'm gonna make sure I do the right stuff here. Where did they tell me to do that? All right, so we've got a couple more formulas to do here. And these are kind of tricky to, no, that shouldn't be too bad. I'm in C21, and that's supposed to be equal to C11, that one, divided by. C23. Well, that's almost the same as those formulas up there. And I'll probably have C12. Yep. So in here, that equals C12. That one. Divided by C23. Enter. Now I want these two to fill one column to the right. And I want these two to copy. I'm going to copy them. Control C and paste them into here. And maybe here too. Let's see if they did those as well. Yep. 
Yes. So I'm going to paste them into here as well. All right, now mine looks like the book. That's a lot of formulas. I think we're about done. Maybe not. A little bit more. We need a total. So, O26. Holy cow. O26. Wait, whoop, right there. O26. You want the word total. And down here, we're going to do an auto sum again because I want the sum of all the numbers to the left. In this case, Excel is going to take a good guess and say, how about if I add up all those numbers from C27 to N27? That's exactly what we want. So we press Enter, and it gives me a nice number. And now we can copy that, or click, drag the fill handle. There's that little guy on the end, and just drag him all the way down until you hit the bottom. And drop. Okay. All right. Now we got a little bit more, then we're almost done here. B47. So B47, that's here. No, oh, it's way over. I gotta slide over. There's B47. I want the word total. And the book likes to make them all caps, and that's fine. And then press tab to move over. And now we want totals again. Now here's the tricky thing. C47 to O47. Highlight all of these cells, because I want them all to have the same formula. What the authors are showing you here, all the way over to O47. What the authors are showing you is you can select cells first and then calculate an auto sum. Won't it add them all up? No, it'll do each one of them separately. So if I now click on auto sum, it'll auto sum every one of those cells for me. So there's a number of ways to skin that cat. We could highlight the cells first and then say auto sum. I sure hope it picks the right cells. I don't get any answer. I don't get any questions, right? It just did it. So there's 27 to 46, column F. So I'm looking at the formula. Sounds good. So I must have done that right. Now, these numbers are kind of hard to read. So the next thing we're going to do is format these numbers so that they're a little easier to read, particularly with commas, maybe some dollar signs and those kinds of things. So going into the book and moving a few pages forward, I'm now on 82. And the book's talking about all the different ways that we can format with numbers and commas and dollar signs and decimal places and percent signs. And here's some examples. This is one that confuses many students. You want to be careful. There are two different dollar sign formats. One of them is called currency. The other one's called accounting. Currency format puts the dollar sign right up against the number. It's flush. Currency format uses a minus sign. And if it's zero, it shows zero. Accountants, like programmers, have their own language. And so accounting format, the dollar signs are all fixed. They're in one position. They're not attached to the numbers. Always at the left edge of the cell. Negative numbers appear in parentheses, and zeros appear as dashes. That's normal for accounting format. Usually freaks some people out sometimes. So subtle difference between those two. And the kicker is when you come up here and you say, give me dollar signs, if you touch that, it says, accounting, whoa, I'm not an accountant. That's not usually the one I want. If you're an accountant, you're happy because that's great. But if you don't like that one, you just drop it down and you get all these different ones. And none of those are really what we want here. None of them are currency. We'll figure out how to do that in just a second. Okay, we did all that. We're just flying through the book here. Okay, we're supposed to format the gross sales. That's C6 to E6. I'm going to press Control Home. Whoa, I didn't do what I wanted it to do. That didn't either. 
So I'm going to do it the other way. Up here at the top is the address bar. If I want to go to cell A1, I can just type in there, A1. And there I am. Now this weekend I thought I was going to be smart, and I practiced and did things, and oh, that's what I missed a key. Okay. None of your business. I'm on a Mac. It does weird things sometimes when I'm using it for Windows. So now here I am back at A1 so I can find my way around. We're supposed to go to C6 to E6. C6, gross sales, to E6, right there. Not F6, nothing to be careful of. Okay, that's a percentage over there. I don't want to change that. And we're supposed to make it the accounting format. So this dollar sign should do that. If you forget about that, you can always drop this down, and there's accounting. They both do the same thing. Again, the book or the tutorial online stuff may be picky and make you do it a certain way. It doesn't matter. Oh, what? Don't let the pound sign scare you. Simply means the number's too big, doesn't fit. That's all it means. A couple of solutions here. We could make the cells wider, stretch the columns so that they fit, and the numbers will adjust. Don't follow me here because we're not going to stay here. I'm going to. I highlighted those. I'm going to highlight those three cells. I'm going to highlight the three columns now and just double click. Don't follow. Double click, and it auto sizes the columns. But I got two decimal places, and at least for this summary, I don't need decimal places, so I'm going to undo that. And instead, I'm going to reduce the number of decimal places that are showing. How would I know that there's too many decimal places here? That's my question. I don't know. So I would normally resize. But the book tells us, hey, you got too many decimal places. These buttons up here in the number group, right underneath the word accounting, allow you to increase and decrease the number of decimal places. I can never quite remember which one. The pictures are supposed to help me go from 0 to 2, go from 2 to 0. But I always have to kind of hover over them to figure it out. Decrease, we want to decrease by two, so you have to click it twice. One, two. And now the numbers fit again. So don't let the pound sign scare you. It just means the number is too big to fit in the cell, and numbers do not automatically spill over like text does. So that's what that means. Just either make the cell wider, column wider, or change the format so that it fits better. Now we're supposed to apply the comma style to C7 to E9, C7 to E9. Why don't they just do currency here? Too many dollar signs distracts things. So they like to put the dollar signs at the top, but not here. Comma format. Comma gives you numbers with commas. And, oh darn, two decimal. Now here I can see them, see? Two decimal places. So I'm going to take the decimal places out. You still get parentheses, that's okay. And we're also supposed to do that to C11 to E12. C11, E12, down here. Now, I'm going to jump ahead here just a little bit. We could just hit comma again and down two decimal places, or remember in Word, the format painter? Copy the format from one place to another. Here's a format that I like. I'm going to grab the little paintbrush, click it once, and just paint these six cells, and now they have the same format. I think the book talks about that a little later. A lot of the skills you learned in Microsoft Word work here. You see the same buttons, they do the same thing. Copy formats. Now we're going to do percentages, so we'll do the same kind of technique. We're going to select F6 to F9. If you were really brave, you could select F11 and F12 at the same time. Remember, that's a collection of cells from last time, or a, what did they call it, non-adjacent range? That works. Or you can do them one at a time and then copy the formats. I guess you're going to have to follow what the instructions tell you. I want this to be percent. When you click on percent, you get a percentage. Excel, behind the scenes, still has the 0.129 number, 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 number stuff. Actually, in this cell, it has a formula. So Excel is lying to us lots of times here. It shows a formula, and we said show it to me as a percentage. 
this formula ends up as a decimal. When you format for percent, it automatically multiplies by 100. That's just a given. And the book says, give me two decimal places. So now we have to increase the number of decimal places. The button to the left a couple times until you see what we want. Good. And then what? They just do those. How come they don't do these? Oh, I know why. Okay, formatting dates and times. Going back to the documentation sheet temporarily. I want to format this date. When I typed it without the year, I get this funky looking 6 October format. To change the date format, you have to come up here. Notice it's already set to custom. There is no magic button for dates. It's already set to custom. And there are two short date and long date predefined date formats. The book says we want long date. Click. And now the date is long date format, but notice what's stored in the cell. That was there, by the, by the way, before we started. I'm going to undo that. Leave yours alone. Undo that real quick. Notice what's stored in the cell. 6-10-2014. It's just formatted in a funky way. Why it does it that way, I don't know. We changed it to long format, and the book says while you're at it, make that left aligned. So click the left align button, and now it's left aligned. The book takes a couple of minutes to talk about alignment. We've already talked about most of them. I'm on page 87 now. And they talk about top align, middle, left, right. And they also talk about indent. We're going to be using this in a minute. And we'll also be using orientation. The cool thing about Excel is you don't have to have your text horizontal. You can rotate it, angle it, do all kinds of weird things with it. And we've already talked about wrap text. And did we do emerge and center in the first unit? I think so. So we've seen some of those already. So then it says left align the date, did that. Go back to sales report. So go back to the other tab. Select C5 to F5. C5 to oh, 5. There we go. Title. C5 to F5. Center them. I'm not sure I completely agree with that. I sometimes have arguments with myself about how should I align my labels across the top of my columns. Sometimes center works. Over numbers, I like right aligned. Over text, I, I like left aligned. So it kind of depends. Notice here, this one's left aligned over the text. That looks pretty good. Numbers, eh, it's not bad. Right aligned looks good too. So you follow the instructions in the book. Real world, you got to decide what looks good. To indent, B7 to B8, B7 to B8. These two labels are really sub-numbers of the gross sales. They are what make up the gross sales, are these two numbers. So what they want us to do is indent them so that we can see that. These two buttons are just like the decimal numbers, indent and unindent. And they said, do it a couple times, I think. Increase button twice. Click, click. Each time you press indent, it's not like Microsoft Word where it goes to the next tab marker. There are no tab markers here. Here's just one space. So if you want to indent it more, press it twice. And then we're supposed to select B5 to F5. B5 to F5. That's all of those. Now what are you going to make me do? Put borders around them, but just a bottom border. Okay. A bottom border. There it is up at the top. Notice there's some thicker ones. They don't ask for those. They just want a regular old border. Now, one thing I want to mention to you here that the book doesn't explain very clearly, they do a decent job, is that you should never put borders on numbers. These are formulas. Some of these are formulas. So those are okay, but I wouldn't want to put a border on this. Couldn't I just put a top border on that number? Yes, you could and it will look the same. But in the future, you're going to learn how to sort this data and move it around. If you put borders on numbers and then you resort them, the borders go with the numbers instead of the titles. That's annoying. So you put borders under titles and over totals. It's not in the book. 
try to keep that in the back of your brain. If not, no big loss. It'll be okay as long as it looks good, right? That's what people are going to be looking at. Not necessarily. You do a great job, build this worksheet, then you get promoted, and the next guy comes along and says, geez, what person put these borders in all these goofy places? And you still got to build them right, even if they, and they have to look good all at the same time. B6 to F6. B6 to F6. That's all of these. The accountants want a bottom border on those, too. Okay. So I just click that same button. I didn't even drop it down because it's already got the right border, I know, because I just clicked that a minute ago. And now there's borders on both of them. B9 to F9. B9 to F9. Those are totals. They're probably going to tell us to put borders on top. Yes, they do. So i got to drop it down and put a top border on it. They tell you to do it, but they don't give you a good reason why I don't. Why don't I just put a bottom border on here? It's just not the way, not the right way to do it. Put top borders on totals, bottom borders on titles. And that way, if you have to rearrange these for some reason, the borders don't go with them. If you watch, you don't have to follow. Watch what happens when I drag this. The border didn't go with it. That's interesting. Not what I expected. Thought the border would go with it. How about you? Notice the border went with it. As it should. It's the total. If I drag this one, the border stays put. I'm just moving in a different location. So that's why we put the borders where they tell us to. B3, okay. And now what you want to do. It's almost time for a break. Can we get to the end of this section here? I think so. In the name box, this is interesting. It can save you some time. In the name box, that's this guy. Whoops. That's this guy. It says type C7, or C27, excuse me, colon O27. Capitalization is not important. In the book, they always capitalize them. doesn't matter. C27 colon, so that's a range. If you press Enter, it selects that range. That's the same range we had a little while ago. Or very similar to it. So that's a quick way, instead of dragging... If you need to select a very large range, you can type it. And whether you type it or not, it's completely up to you. They want this to be, I'm sorry, click, if you missed it, click up here again and type C27 colon O27. Got the colon in there, not a semicolon? O. Oh. And it's an O, not a zero. And you should see a bunch of highlighted cells. Okay. Or I could have clicked here and dragged all the way down to the bottom. Ooh, watch, don't follow. Here's another way to select. I don't know if you learned this in Microsoft Word or not. I'm going to click the first cell, which is this one. I'm going all the way down to the bottom. There's my bottom, and I was supposed to go to A47 or O47. If I shift-click this, did you learn that one in Microsoft Word? Yeah. Yep. Shift-click, it highlights everything in between. So that's another way to highlight cells. doesn't matter which way you do it, as long as you get the right ones. And we were supposed to do C27 to C46, or C47, so I think I got that. Make all those comma style. Take out the decimal places. Align them to the top, I think. Yep. So that's this button, align to the top. Looks okay. Bear with me. All right, back in the name box again, C26 this time, colon, O26. So we're going sideways. Can't type. Colon, O. 26, all the same row. Press Enter. Selects all of my month names and probably the title as well, the total. They want those centered. Click the Center Align button. Okay, then they say B27 to B46. B27, that's this one to B46. Now you could have typed it or you can drag it. 
That's all of these. Change font size to 9. Indent. One time. Just to make them shift over a little bit. Align to the top. Probably didn't need to do that, but that helps. And then, I'm going to go back to the name bar now. B47 to 040, 4, B47, 047. Colon, don't forget the colon. Enter. That gave me my totals down at the bottom. Cool, that's what we're supposed to have according to the book. Supposed to have a top and bottom borders button. So click on this one, and we've got a top and bottom border. It makes a border on the top and the bottom all at the same time. Okay, looks good. And then O20, new, new formula, O26 to O46. O26 to... What? Say that again, Volker. O26 to O46. Okay. O26, O46. Should be our totals. They're there. Yep. And we're supposed to use all borders for that one. And then click someplace to change the highlight or delete the selection. Man, I got a lot in this first unit. Let's keep going. Now, I'm supposed to merge cells. I haven't done this. I thought we did it in the last unit, but we didn't. Notice that all of these cells belong to Wisconsin. It is possible in Microsoft Word to merge cells so that they become one big cell, and Excel treats them as one big cell. So highlight all those cells, A27 to A33. In your home group, there's a Merge and Center button. What Merge and Center does is two things. It merges all the cells in that range that you have to, that you've selected. You have to select them first. And if there's any text in there, it centers it. Now be careful. What if I had text in here and here and here and here? Uh -uh. You lose it all except the first one. So when you do this, make sure you only have one piece of text in there before you get started. So there's Wisconsin, merge and center. This, by the way, is what I mean up on the board up there when I said merge each group. This is a group. In your homework assignment, you're going to do the same thing. So with the homework assignment, what I'm suggesting you do is let's go down here to Minnesota. Merge the cells for Minnesota, merge and center. Highlight them, hit the same button. Iowa's only got, yeah, Iowa's got some. Merge and center. Colorado's only got one. Book says do it anyways because it'll center it. Then Nebraska and Kansas. Do the whole bunch. So just keep going down and you can see who belongs to what where and just merge them. This is now one big cell. Now I'm going to deviate from the book. Everybody got them merged? I'm going to select all of those merged cells. Wisconsin all the way down to Kansas. The book does this one at a time, and then they do some other stuff that just doesn't work very well. I want to rotate this text so that it goes this way. Rotate text is this guy right here. Drop down the list, and you can rotate it. You can set a current angle. You can do all kinds of stuff. The book wants us to rotate up. So the text starts at the bottom and reads up. There's also a down, and you can actually customize this to make it do just about anything you want. And so now all my text is reading vertically. And I still have all those cells selected. This one's selected as well. <clears throat> I'm supposed to align them to the middle. So that's this one, up and down, put them in the middle. 
Notice because they're all selected, I can do this all at once. Then the book says repeat it, repeat it, repeat it. Right. Colorado's kind of messy. We'll fix that in a minute. Reduce the width of column A to 7. So I'm going to right-click column width, right-click on the cell header, 7. Now we've got them turned sideways. We don't need so much room. Cool. Colorado kind of fits, but they ask us to make it a little bigger. I don't care how big it is. Just make it a little bigger so it looks good. Cool. Stuck? Okay. Let me pause the recording there. We're getting pretty close. And then we'll take a break, and then we'll come back. And I still don't have a timer, so that'll be, let's come back at... About 13 after. How's that?